Good afternoon. I'm Greg Fleming, the CEO of Rockefeller Capital Management. And it's my pleasure today to be here with Rashir Sharma, who's chairman of Rockefeller International, for uh, a discussion uh, that's uh, centered around our third quarter and Rashir's third quarter investment outlook. We're now well into July. So uh, welcome to all of our clients, uh, our colleagues, and friends of Rockefeller. Rashir, uh, we got a lot to talk about, right? as we were just uh, starting to uh, preview. But let's uh, begin with uh, the U.S. economy, the resilience, a developing consensus around soft landing. Are you surprised? Well, I'd say that somewhat, but in terms of, if I go back to what we discussed at the beginning of the year, what was our central template? Our central template, which we spoke about, was that we're in a long grind. And what I meant by that was that, firstly, if the entire economist community is calling for a recession, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> because, in fact, I wrote a piece about this as well, which is that the track record of economists calling a recession is practically zero. They've never forecast a recession. And this time, you had a, such a large majority of economists forecasting a recession. So you and, knew something and, and was going to happen. They are forecasting it, and it was not coming, and they said, don't worry, it's going to get here, right? I mean, they've been forecasting Yeah, so it's very unlike economists to forecast a recession, because they usually deal in increments, right? Which is So it's very unlike that. So I think one of it was that expectations of a recession were far too widespread. So it, was, it didn't take that much to be surprised. Having said that, my own sort of template was that because there's so much stimulus money still in the economy at both levels, both the monetary stimulus, and you can see that in the amount of bank deposits which are there, the amount of money which is still lying in money market funds, there's so much liquidity still floating around the system despite the fact that the Fed has raised rates so uh, aggressively you have a lot of money. And remember that the real interest rate has only now gone positive in the United States. That because the Fed was so behind, the real interest rate in the United States was negative uh, right up until a couple of months ago, in fact. So but now you've gone they, positive. But it has gone positive, which is an important uh, distinction, right? Yes. I mean, that is an important event. Yes, yeah. but the other thing which I think is underappreciated is just the amount of fiscal spending which is going on still. It's, it's incredible the amount of fiscal spending. Percent, right? yes. yes, and you know, because I just documented that, that if you looked at the US, uh, you know, like uh, after the pandemic, forget the pandemic relief, after the pandemic, the US and the Biden you're administration- excluding, You're excluding the Trump pandemic and the Biden first, the $2 trillion Biden spent when he first was elected. So you are saying- Well, I'm excluding the stuff which was done in the pandemic, but after Biden came to office, which is practically after the pandemic, yeah. You know, spending was done. They spent another six trillion dollars in terms of the economy. So this huge amount of spending which is going on. They're doing it under the guise of that we need to compete with China, we need to rebuild America. They're doing that. But whatever, it's a massive amount of spending which is going on, which also is providing a fiscal impulse to the economy, right? So and I think that's underappreciated. Six percent of six percent deficit. As yes. far as the eye can see, right? And That's right. Even the CBO, uh, they're estimating that the U.S. is going to run a budget deficit of 6% of GDP or close to that for the practically the rest of the decade. There's no other developed country in the world that's running a budget deficit of that size. Even the United States, you know, this whole consensus has come about here. Oh, the deficits don't matter because we are the United States. We have the world's reserve currency. And look at all these people who have been crying wolf about deficits. There's been a debt clock in Times Square since 1989, right. which is moved location, but it's still something which was there with much fanfare. Uh, and that all these things don't matter. And my point is, yeah, but just look at the history, which is that the US used to run a budget deficit of about 3% of GDP in line with the other countries. Now it's running something which is more than twice the level of other countries or projected to be like over the coming years. So just to sort of put this into perspective, my point is that, yes, it's a bit surprising that the U.S. economy is doing as well as it, uh, it is. Even in the second quarter, we'll get the GDP numbers very shortly. The economy is expected to have grown at 2%. That's a very good growth rate for an economy at this stage of the business cycle, especially given what uh, the other challenges here. But I just want to put this in perspective, which is that let's not forget that a lot of this is being boosted by, a, by fiscal spending, which is huge. And the second point, which I said, is that there's still a lot of monetary stimulus which was there in the economy. And the last thing I'll say here is that I was not expecting a recession. What I was expecting was a bit of a long grind, which is that growth would slow down. The problem would be that once growth slows down and let's say, you know, hits 
zero or sub one percent, then the amount of stimulus you have left this time to pump the economy again is not going to be much because one, inflation is a bit stickier, and two is the fact that you've already fired so many bullets uh, now. So I think that's the overall framework that I expect of the U.S. economy. So then the question is: so are we in fact going to avoid a recession? We think we are. Yes, for now. And, yes. And then um, the slow grind. Are you still predicting the slow grind scenario? Where I mean, it was two percent. Yes. We'll see. We'll see about uh, where we go from here. But are you expecting that to? recede and then us to be in the position you just described where it's very slow growth maybe it's not technically a recession but it doesn't feel good yeah and yet the fed's still doing quantitative tightening and rates stay high and fiscal spending can't go higher and that's a problem are you are yes you- i think that's the rough scenario that i you know that i had uh sort of um painted uh at the beginning of the year when we had a discussion. And that's and, still in the cards. And I still feel that's in the cards. So yeah, yeah, recession avoided. There's nothing out there to suggest that, that this is going to happen. Of course, there are some people who come back to me and tell me, oh, recession could still happen. Look at the past cycles, that whenever the yield curve got inverted, eventually a recession always happened. It's just that on average- It's taken it a long time this time. Yeah, yeah, not really. Because really? If you look at the past cycles, it, it's typically taken about 18 months. From the, from the original inversion. Exactly. From wow. the, yeah, yeah okay. uh, like 2006 or, you know, like past and stuff. If you look at it, 18 months has roughly been the average duration. So that uh, cannot be completely dismissed. Now, I do feel that we should not hang our hat on just one indicator, but that cannot be completely dismissed. Because and and we're not through. It's been 12 months, 14, not 18, yeah, right? We're yeah, it's really been 12 months since okay. the inversion, you know, like uh, happened, right? Okay. So the Fed went very quickly. Yeah. Uh, so I think that it's still too early to say that is out, but just looking at the broad indicators, it doesn't seem as if a recession is imminent at all just yeah. now. With the long grind scenario, which is what I've sort of said, which is that growth slows down as some of this excessive stimulus tapers off and some of the excessive savings that the consumer has tapers off. I think that then the problem is that there's not that much left to try and stimulate because you're already with yeah, very high paid deficits. deficits. Yeah. It, yeah. By then, but if yeah. growth slows down and revenues come off, yeah. we could really be at 70%. Yeah. So let's go to uh, markets because so, uh, there's so much going on that a lot of people, again, have not predicted, including the overall level of the market. First of all, are you surprised with S&P 4550, 4600? I'm really surprised uh, specifically about how the mega caps have done, the mega cap tech stocks have done. So because Again, when I look back at the forecast that we did at the beginning of the year, uh, that was not something I was expecting. Uh, so the mega caps doing so well has been a real surprise. And you know, they seem to have broken out into a different uh, orbit, which is that it doesn't seem as if even higher rates are denting them anymore because you've seen rates back up a bit, uh, but even that's not denting them anymore. Now they're all caught up in this AI craze, right? That everyone thinks that AI is the big new thing, and that these mega caps are again going to benefit from it. Which is why it was a lot of the stock price game for, for some of these, the give us a seven is the phrase now, right? Yes, can, that's right. You can tell us in a second who's, a, who's in the seven. But a lot of the uh, stock price appreciation is around multiple expansion, Yes. as opposed to any kind of earnings boost. Right. So it is kind of uh, either AI or something that says earnings are going to grow in the future and justify the higher multiples, right? I mean, that's what's going on. Absolutely, spot on. So that's exactly what's going on, you know, which is that, uh, and I think this AI craze benefiting the Magnificent Seven. Can you describe, can you define who's in the Magnificent Seven? So everybody. Well, I mean, you know, all all these FANG stocks, you know, once again are there, and then you have the Teslas of the world. I think there's Netflix also, which is part of it. So, you know, like- And NVIDIA is new now, right, aren't they? NVIDIA is the only new real, I mean, the one new company, you can see. I think one of the issues I've had with the US of late is that when you look at past innovation waves, you always have new companies which are the forefront of it. Yeah. It happened in the tech boom in uh, in like the 2000 when you had the Cisco, the JDS Uniface, so those yes, companies. And, and been, Amazon came out of that. Right? Yeah, ex- yeah, exactly. Amazon you know, was one of the survivors of that. And yeah. then even in the past innovation uh, waves, such as the PC boom of the early 80s or the mainframe boom of the late 1960s, you had a lot of new companies at the forefront of it. And What's the difference this time? Post, uh, uh, the Great Recession, you had, you know, the uh, Googles and companies like that grow out of that. Yeah. Uh, Meta, right? That was, right. Uh, they were all fairly new then. Yeah. Exactly. So every time, you, you know, like at the start of a decade or, you, or at, the, at the start of a new innovation boom, you have new companies which are at the forefront or relatively new companies, companies they, they even heard of. Yeah. The fact that you have an AI wave this time and the same companies which had done so well 
the same trillion to the trillion dollar companies, the same companies are benefiting from that. There's been something dysfunctional out here. And for me, the dysfunctionality, one of course is the fact that data has become such a price play now that like everybody thinks that these big companies can uh, benefit the most from uh, exploiting data, which is needed for AI. The one factor which I think is really underappreciated, and uh, you would know this well, is, I, is that I think the most pro-incumbent thing is regulation. When you have too much regulation, it often ends up having the perverse effect of benefiting the incumbents. Why? Because the incumbents are the ones who have the resources to be able to spend on regulation. The incumbents are the ones who have the resources to be able to lobby with Congress uh, in terms of getting the kind of uh, regulation which favors them. But hasn't that, I mean, that's a, I, I think it's a good theory, but has that always been the case though? With, I mean, the incumbents this time seem to have more staying power, and as you said, longer. But didn't the incumbents 20 years ago and 30 years ago benefit from the same? Exactly. That's what's changed dramatically, which is the amount of regulation today in the system is at a record high. It's okay. incredible amount of regulation. If I just, you know, like show you like the register in terms of, you know, how much regulation over time, it keeps going up and up. And now it's at a totally different level. And I think that you know this, you would know this from starting a company actually, which is that the amount of and so this is not just true for tech, it's true across industries. Yeah. That the amount of money it takes today to set up a new business, yeah. you know, whether it's legal fee, whether it's got to do with uh, just uh, checking uh, different boxes, has gone up dramatically uh, in terms of you know, what needs to be done. And I think that this is having the perverse effect of benefiting the incumbents like never before. And, and so what do we do about that? I mean, it, it, it sounds like in your view that's been mostly secular. It doesn't matter whether it's Republican, Democrat. Yeah. It just keeps growing. Exactly. It keeps growing and has grown up even more in the last two or three years. I think that, the, that you need awareness of the Congress. And I think that this is where I have an issue with some of the liberals as well. That even when they're sort of, you know, saying that, listen, we need to help the smaller person by having more regulation, the intention may be correct that you want to help the smaller person, but I don't think they realize the perverse effect that tagging on more and more regulation ha has, which is of really sort of, you know, uh, killing the startup culture. Yeah. Because, so, because, you know, both parties, the Democrats say this as well, support small business, right? Everybody wants to support small business. So, yes. you know, if that's the goal, you're saying they're all going about it the wrong way at this point. Yeah, right? because I think that you have to think of regulation as to how to make it pro-competition. That's what regulation needs to do. How to make it pro-competition, not that it ends up being pro-incumbent. I think the pro-incumbent nature of regulations that we have had is a big contributing factor to why across industries, not just in tech, the big keep getting bigger. So is this is this a, a, a problem that's going to start to uh, affect the job creation machine that is the United States? Because I mean, when you look at where we are now, yeah, uh, inflation is coming down, yeah, and, and it may be sticky between four and two, but it's certainly in a better zip code. Uh, recession avoided, employment at all time highs. There's a lot of positive here, and you're one of the people that for years have been quite positive in this economy. It does seem like where the United States economy is doing as well or better again on a relative basis than any any economy in the world. Is this problem of excess of regulation that's supporting these huge companies continuing to get bigger going to choke off the, the job creation machine that small business is in this country? Well, I'm not sure like it uh, chokes it off because the demographics have shifted a lot, right? Because I mean, one thing which is helping the job market a lot also now. We don't have workers. Exactly. You know, the, de the demographics have shifted. The yeah. demographics, you know, like, Demographics have shifted, and on immigration, we've seen some pickup, but as you've argued in the past, not enough not to enough. try and fix, you know, still what not they, enough. Yeah. a bipartisan plan, I don't understand it. Yeah, so we still have those issues. So I think that, you know, there are multiple dynamics at play, but what this has done by giving big corporations so much power, for sure, is that it has given them much more power over profits than over wages, right, in terms of the number. They've been able to keep wages suppressed because of the amount of power they have. And I think this also has an impact on productivity because for high productivity, you need more startups to come. You need newer innovations, companies yeah. to come, innovations to come through newer companies. So I think that those are the issues that we need to think about, that what are the issues, but the whole central message which I want to emphasize here is that think about it. Why are the big getting bigger? And some of the reasons are documented, like you know the fact that they have access to big data much more and they have the resources to spend much more of that. But the, but the fact that 
regulation tends to be pro-incumbent. Mm -hmm. Is I think not well understood or, or internalized by our policy. No, that's a great. That's a great theme. Uh, so let's go to um, uh, the dollar, and then we want to work our way around the world. So um, uh, the rate cycle may be starting to flatten here. Where, where are we in the dollar? Uh, you know, from a, a strength standpoint going forward relative to other currencies. And you've also talked about, we should spend a second on, it, you know, the role of the dollar as the reserve currency. I mean, are, is that behind us? Are we, are you still worried about that over time? So, so let's yeah, talk I think about the so. so I think I, that this is one of the things which has worked out well. As I said, you know, like I, uh, as a sort of mental exercise, we keep a check on the top 10 trends we spoke about at the beginning of the year, what's working out, what's not working out, mega cap tech, uh, doing much better than I thought, but the dollar is pretty much doing what I thought, which is that the dollar has been on a weakening path. Yeah. And I think there are two dynamics at play. One is cyclical, one structural. The cyclical one is that the dollar had become very overvalued, uh, very expensive after having been in a bull market for nearly a decade, right? And it become very overvalued against many currencies like around the world. And that overvaluation is now being corrected. It's fallen a lot, in fact, this year against some of the emerging market currencies, uh, against the um, Mexican peso is now called the super peso, uh, yes. the, you know, like the Brazilian real, but even Small the euro. Everywhere, yeah. yeah, exactly. Euro, yeah. So, yeah. So the dollar has, I think, finally begun to correct from a very overvaluation uh, uh, zone. So that is, uh, I think, a cyclical thing. But now let's look at the structural issue. The structural issue is the fact that there are lots of countries in the world which were shaken badly by the way the U.S. had used its financial power to impose sanctions on Russia. It may have been the morally the right thing to do, but it shook them. That here is the uh, standard bearer of the global financial system and look at how they cut a country off. Uh, whatever the reason may be, I think a lot of countries took it almost personally. So they have been quietly diversifying outside of the US dollar. And so what though? Exactly. A lot of other alternatives, right? Like gold has been a big beneficiary of that. We spoke about that in the past. Yes. Even some of the smaller currencies. Uh, the Swiss franc today is at a 10 year high against the dollar. Uh, it, like in fact, uh, which is quite incredible, you know, given all the banking issues that Switzerland's had, yeah. but it's at a 10-year high. Uh, but even uh, the Canadian dollar, the Australian dollar, you see the central bank's foreign reserves around the world. You see the dollar's share is coming down so gradually, yeah. and they're diversifying away because they don't want to be caught so much with the dollar. And, and, it, and look at the oil trade today. It's very interesting what's happening today, like uh, as far as oil is concerned. Many countries around the world are now trading in oil by cutting out the dollar and dealing bilaterally. The most interesting thing I heard about is in India's case where they're still allowed to trade with Russia, but Russia only accepts apparently payments in the Chinese currency from them. Wow. So, I mean, the dollars cut out of it. Yeah. So, this is a very slow moving process. This is not something which you hear about on a daily basis. Because ultimately, if it's going to not be the reserve currency, there has to be a replacement. Because what you're talking about is a diversification, which it, it, I agree with you, is also secular and was, it's problematic in many ways for the United States. But the notion of an alternative is still hard to see, right? That's right. So there's not one alternative, but also nature abhors a vacuum. So this attitude that where else will the money go? There is no alternative. There's a problem with that, yeah. right? Because of the fact that uh, people will find alternatives. Nobody wants and to be stuck. And they are. And they are slowly finding alternatives. Yeah. I mean, the U.S. is lucky that the Chinese have such a bad financial system and that the Chinese system is so closed that the Chinese currency has never been able to sort yeah. of even punch close to the weight of the Chinese economy in the yeah. global uh, economy. But the fact that you've got these other alternatives out there, I think is a, you know, well, let's, fascinating Let's thing. use that to shift to China. So how is the Chinese economy doing? You know, they've, uh, they're have obviously completely out of the pandemic now and uh, things seem more challenged than people had thought. I mean, there was a rally, right? Six months ago. Yeah. The end of last year, coming into the new year, uh, a lot of the Chinese stocks uh, had a, a good month or two on the notion that they were reopening and there was going to be a pop, no pop, huh? That's right. I mean, you got a pop, but I think this finally recognition across the board now, something that we've discussed for many years, You've been writing about for that, many years. That, that China has a serious demographic challenge. Its population is set to shrink for the first time this year. Yeah. China has a serious debt problem. You know, we speak about the U.S. debt issue, but in China, the debt as a share of its economy is higher than even the United States, even though its per capita income is much lower. So the fact that China has a serious debt issue, has a demographic issue, and also the fact that companies around the world now are diversifying outside of China, uh, that uh, 
you know, they're setting up their, they're the still, supply chains and things yeah, the like supply that. chain is still going offshore, so the wage gap is still very high, but now they're going to Vietnam, Indonesia, India, Mexico, yeah. but they're diversifying. And they're doing that quietly to not alienate the Chinese. Is the Chinese government aware of that? Are they watching that? Yes, in fact, I think one of the silver linings coming out of all this is that you're seeing a softening in the Chinese government's approach, even to international relations, partly, I think, guided yeah, by the economy. Were, they were somewhat, uh, they opened, uh, open arms to uh, carry, right? Carry yeah. had a relatively cordial visit. It seemed like. But in general, you know, like Janet Yellen has been there, yeah. and even off, the, uh, you know, like the back channel diplomacy, Henry Kissinger at the age of 100 is in China today. He is? <laughs> yes. I didn't know that. Yeah, so he's, he has exactly incredible energy. I mean, like a really inspiration. You see how yeah. someone at the age of 100 is still active. He's, he's now turned 100, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, there was a big party for yeah. last month for that. But I think that it's really incredible the fact that you have this. Uh, softening happening in China now because I think they realize that the economic situation there, you know, that, that they can't cut themselves from the rest of the world. Because if you look at the foreign direct investment going to China, it's plummeting. It's really plummeting. Uh, Not just from American firms. From across, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, so it's gone down. So I think that they're aware of that. The economic weakness is getting them to react. And, you know, whatever else you say about the Chinese policymakers, they have, you know, they're, they've made many mistakes, but I think that they're also a bit pragmatic. Uh, I, I mean, I, until yeah. recently, I thought it was a long, pragmatic run, and yeah. they've made a lot of positive yeah. Uh, yeah. decisions over many decades, right? I mean, to go from the size of the economy they were to the 12th second biggest economy, there were a lot of good decisions. Absolutely. But the, the pragmatism has been less in evidence in recent years, right? Yeah, yeah. but I think that you're seeing some signs there of softening, you know, which are taking place because the economy is really in bad shape, too, uh, which is that the, there's, you know, like... I think that the economy will not grow more than two or three percent on a trend basis. Yeah. Uh, you may you still have some bounces here for the reopening. On a trend basis, it's going to be two or three percent for the rest of the decade. Which is a big challenge for them. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about um, the uh, the overall uh, geographic and, and global diversification picture from the standpoint of uh, an emerging market expert. So when you look at a portfolio now, you have U.S. investors saying, "Hey, uh, we've got the Magnificent Seven. We've got S and P at forty five fifty. We have a soft landing, no recession. You know they're still directing a lot of their resources into the American market, maybe justifiably given some of the run here. But how would you uh, balance that around the world? Uh, where, where, which other markets are you uh, quite upbeat on? Yeah, so I think that there's no doubt that the U.S. will remain the premier financial market of the world for the foreseeable future. We know that. My only issue is about capital allocation, as we've discussed, which is that if you look at the standard MSCI benchmark, that has the U.S. weighted over 60%, right? And the fact that the U.S. economy is 25%, yeah. uh, that disconnect for me just feels jarring. Uh, and and some of it got fixed last year, but now it's going back, right? Uh, somewhat, although we have yeah. seen this year, some of the other markets have popped quite a bit. Japan's... Uh, yeah. have been one of them. We spoke about Japan at the beginning of the year. Japan had a pretty good run this year. Yeah. And that was one of your uh, ten, top 10 ideas, right? That's right. That's right. And I think that even in Europe, we have seen some economies pick up, uh, uh, particularly in places like Eastern Europe. We spoke about, you know, like in, uh, I think the biggest turnaround case has been Greece, right? Which has, you know, been a really like, incredible. That market's, I think, in dollar terms, up more than 40% this year. Uh, it's so it's I think a long ways. Remember, that was the, 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 the in 2010 or 11, they were the ones who but it I yeah. mean, right about 2015, 16, that was the poster child of everything that was wrong with Europe, yes. right? That was the crisis Deficits, economy. you know, yeah. Debt, everything, yeah. right? But that's what happens. When you have an economy which has the back to the wall, that's all. The only time when they carry out serious economic reforms to keep They have no up. choice. They have no choice. So they did that. Uh, so I think that you're seeing some signs of that. I think that, like, among emerging markets, India, Indonesia, we, you know, these kind of countries are doing very well. Latin America, as I mentioned, Mexico is clearly benefiting from the uh, uh, reshoring that's happening yeah. away from China. China back to yeah. Mexico. And you're seeing that Which now. is a kind of full circle. Because so, you know, 30 years ago, you know, made in Mexico was on a lot of things. Right. And then it all went to made in China, and yes. now it's coming back to Mexico. Exactly. So that's the whole point about investing, that to understand there are cycles. Yeah. Cycles last longer than you think, but when the turn happens, it can happen quicker than you think. Yeah. So I think that that's the point, which is that uh, let's not extrapolate even the Magnificent Seven Yes, they've done really well and keep doing well and show no signs of abating, but that these cycles turn. There's never been an instance in U.S. economic history where the same companies have kept on dominating for so long. Uh, but until, uh, but 
for now yet, very hard to call an end to that. But I think that uh, there is a case for diversification just because the capital allocation is so strong. And the dollar begins to weaken, I think that really is what will get people much more interested in investing internationally. Because as you said, as long as these big cap companies are doing well and the dollar was strong, why bother going abroad and losing money? Yeah. Uh, you know, especially like in dollar terms is, is what we all care about. Yeah. But now the dollar has been weakening, that really sort of, I think, changes things. And that, you think that's going to continue? Yeah, because if you look at the past dollar cycle, even if you don't buy the de-dollarization thesis and yeah. think that the US would remain the world's reserve currency, in the last 50 years, whenever the dollar has weakened, it's gone through up cycles and down cycles. And the down cycles have typically lasted five to seven years. Yeah. So, I mean, it seems to me that we've like, only been in a year of a dollar decline here, or barely a year even. So that the next few years, you generally should expect a weaker dollar. And a weaker dollar is generally beneficial for international investing. Yeah. So I think that shift uh, has just about begun. And you have tons of capital which can be allocated that way. So let's uh, let's close on, on we go also go all the way back to AI, which is you know uh, at least in, in concept driving the magnificent seven and a lot of these big uh, big uh, cap stocks. Um, the uh, impact of AI on different industries and how the world's going to look in five or ten years. Your your thoughts on that in twenty years or you know or or is it even sooner? I mean you know the and, and actually you, you already see Rashir the repositioning of industries. You know, you have the writer strike and now the actor strike uh, out in uh, Hollywood. And part of that is, where is that industry going now? How much, what, what, what uh, role will AI play in draft scripts? And, you know, will you need fewer writers? And, uh, yeah. you know, so, so talk a little bit about how you see AI unfolding. Forget the Magnificent Seven now. How is it going to kind of work its way through the American and global economy? Well, I think there's no question that this is a huge development in terms of it's a huge innovation. But then I can go back to the internet boom, right? That it first happened in 2000. But it take, you know, like uh, the hype does give way to like the realism that uh, it'll take a while for these effects to truly percolate through the entire economy. So I'm just concerned that have we telescoped uh, history too quickly, which yeah. is that, you know, like, uh, fine, it's going to happen, but are we sort of, you know, pricing too much of this too quickly? I think that is the whole point. And yeah. The other question people ask me all the time is that, you know, what sort of jobs will be lost? You know, will we have, how will AI impact? And my answer to that is very simple. The history of innovation shows us that jobs are never lost, professions are lost, right? So professions are going to be lost, but there are new jobs which will always come up. From the days of the horse carriage, uh, drivers being replaced by uh, engineers and mechanics uh, as the automobile came through to similarly something which will happen here. So. I'm optimistic about that front. I'm just concerned that too much optimism has been priced into the earnings so, uh, of these stocks. But, you know that's going to happen all very quickly. I think that is my bigger concern. Uh, Rashir Sharma, uh, for our clients and all listening, uh, the mixture that Rashir brings of the perspective throughout history, the things that he's constantly looking at, what's happening that he expected and what's not uh, happening. All tremendous insight for all of the listeners of Rockstar Capital Management. So, as always, thanks for being here. We'll be back uh, for the fourth quarter, uh, and we'll talk about what happened uh, that uh, we talked about today that we thought would happen. And uh, since we live in this uh, incredible uh, moving world, what happened that we weren't expecting. So, all the best, uh, and thank you for listening. Great thanks. work, as always. Thanks so much. Thank you.